It's time for another comic book retrospective. This time we're going to cover a character we haven't really hit before, some creators we've never covered here on the comic book retrospective. We're going to hit Aquaman. And here with me to do that, as always, is award-winning comic book editor, writer Joe Corallo. How you doing, Joseph? I'm all right, Wes. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Also with us is the man so cool they call him the breed, the comic book hoarder. He's got some other nicknames. He might be the voice of the voices. How you doing, Eric Breed? I am also all right. So to this point, we have not covered DC Comics. Aquaman would have been one of the founding members of the Justice League. Very important character. Although he doesn't have quite as many classic runs as a lot of the other really popular characters at DC Comics. Unfortunately, there has been some good stuff recently. Jeff Johns had a nice run. I'd say Dan Abnett's Aquaman run was good, but... I'll be honest, they don't really touch this bad boy. We're going to Showcase 30, The Creatures from Atlantis from February of 1961, written by Jack Miller, artist Ramona Frayden. I'm going to be honest, Joe. I thought females weren't allowed into comic books until 10 years ago. You're telling me in the the early 60s there was a female artist on Aquaman? Yeah, I mean, there were um, there were some women writers um, even before this. Um, Phantom Lady, a lot of those issues were written by a woman, but as of the golden age, but uh, Ramona had been working on Aquaman for a long time. Granted, it was part of Adventure Comics. It wasn't a feature. This is one of the first feature-length Aquaman stories that takes up an entire issue. She sort of bridged that golden age to silver age gap and updated the character, helped update the origin. Um, You know, she co-created Mira, Aqualad, people familiar with the movie that came out a few years ago. That whole origin of, you know, his dad living in the lighthouse and, uh, you know, finding Mira and all that comes from these stories here that uh, we're going to get into. And uh, you should dig it up because there's a great interview with Ramona Frayden around uh, the release of the movie where uh, she says, and I'm not kidding, I read this in the interview. She goes, you know, people used to tell me that, uh, you know, Aquaman, you know, came off kind of gay, but I always thought he was like Rock Hudson. (laughs) (laughs) No wonderful uh, line. (laughs) It's it's great. And, uh, And Jack Miller as well. Jack Miller, one of the pioneers of writing comics and then moving on to TV, because not only did he write, uh, stories about Aquaman, uh, Phantom Stranger, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman. He went on to write a bunch of episodes of that um, the Mighty Hercules cartoon uh, from the 60s. Very nice stuff. And one of the feature parts of this story here, Eric Reed, is Aqualad himself. At this point, I guess every superhero, at least at DC Comics, had to have like a little miniature preteen sidekick. Is that Was that a rule? Unofficial. Because that that was a way in their mind to ensure that they would get the younger readers interested. The point of view character for the younger readers, too. Yeah, so, someone that they could they, they could feel like they they could be. Yeah, this thing has got some wonderful dialogue. Of course, if they wrote Aqualad today in this story, instead of saying "golly," you'd have a bunch of like exclamation points and at signs because you know he'd be cursing or whatever. But this is a different era of comic books. This is absolutely fan-friendly. I love this comic book. You get so much into it. You get an opening adventure. You get the origin of Aquaman, which Joe got into. Then we get a full-length adventure following that. So this thing is fantastic. Showcase number 30. As I mentioned, Joe, we start out, and there is a freighter out there that's got some chemicals on it, and it is in distress. Thankfully, Aquaman and Aqualad have seen what is going on, and they are there to save the day. There's so many wonderful images from Ramona Freight in here where he decides he's going to use all the sea creatures in unique ways to uh, essentially solve the problem. Oh, yeah. No. Uh, Aquaman serves a mighty purpose here. He is. <laughs> he, he is he does a fantastic job. And, and no, it really, uh, really shows that, uh, you know, the, the whales also being used to safely get like the, the cargo uh, out of the ship before it sinks and and all of that it's uh it's so great and and even he's even friendly with terrifying fish (laughs) that we see (laughs) where uh like some electric eels and stuff yeah yeah electric eels that like was it that like angler fish with like the light on it that like comes Mm -hmm. with like the the message and all that it's uh yeah and and it's again it's gorgeously illustrated um 
Ramona Fraden's artwork. It's very pop art. Uh, you can see this influence in people like Darwin Cook, uh, Mike Allred, Paul Pope, uh, Mike Cho, uh, Chris Samney. Like a lot of people uh, have really been inspired over the years. I know uh, Howard Shakin and uh, Walt Simonson were also very big fans of hers. Uh, she really had a major impact in in comic art. Absolutely. So once we get there, Aquaman goes back to the Aqua Cave. I didn't even realize there was an Aqua Cave, but back in the day there was. Aqualad goes on his merry way breed. And as Joe mentioned, there's an angler fish. And apparently this is another part of uh, Aquaman lore I wasn't really all that familiar with. There's this angler fish. He shows up and he, he provides messages. And apparently Atlantis is making a call to Arthur Curry Aquaman. And he remembers that this is the the home of his mother before she was kind of cast out. And then we get this wonderfully illustrated, wonderfully told retelling of the origin of Arthur Curry, Aquaman, mother and father falling in love, the lighthouse. I love the part where he falls in the water as a baby and his dad's like, oh, the baby's in the water. And his mom's like, oh, he'll be fine. And then when he gets under there, the baby's at the bottom of the ocean, you know, and he's playing with uh, all these creatures and stuff. The baby falls in the water. And she's just sitting there and he goes, are you mad? And the dad dives in <laughs> and sees him playing with the fish on the bottom and then the shark. And, you know, and then we find out you know, what happened to his mom, that she was permanently exiled for daring to want to just see what it was like on the surface. You get the feeling that, th that the Atlanteans maybe were not the nicest people in the world you know, in those days, but it, it did make for you know, a nice origin story. And they, and they told it in, what, three, four pages? All you needed to know about the character is done in one scene. As Joe would like to point out, how long would that take today? This would be a four-issue miniseries at least. Just like it might have been later. <laughs> just not, I'm not even counting the rest of this issue. This issue would be like two years, but the origin itself would have been at least four issues. Just wonderfully done. And I love all the images. This thing is just a, it's a real treat to, to read. So he does, obviously he's curious, Joe. He wants to go find out what the heck is going on with Atlantis. Why would they even call me? My mother was cast out. He goes there, and when he arrives, there's these weird-looking, like, kind of red sea creatures, and it turns out they imprison him, and there's, like, the world's, like, uh, I guess, furthest underground, well, it's not underground, underwater prison camp, because Atlantis has been taken over by these creatures are from another dimension, and obviously Arthur has been imprisoned, and they're putting them to hard labor to try and build something. It's really great. They're very terrifying. Um, Aquaman and other Atlanteans are now stuck having to build these uh, contraptions. You know, again, there, there are certain things where you're just like, I'm not sure why they necessarily need pulleys when they're underwater and stuff like that in the same exact way. But, you know, it's fine. Uh, and, and wheels, the bottom, like, carding things. But um, it's it's great. And um, one of the other things that uh, Ramona does an excellent job with is there's always this sort of, like, mist and other stuff, these, like, lines that go through to, like, really show you that they're underwater. And, and I just love it. Um, you know, just seeing that. And, and you also see, like, these, these creatures... They're a very good design. Um, they, they have weapons, they have guns, and all these other things. You see that these things that they're building have the power to literally melt skyscrapers. So, like, Earth's in trouble if if they get this stuff uh, built out of everyone's view under the sea. <laughs> under the sea. So we get this wonderful, these wonderful moments here, Breed. And one of the things that happens to Curry, you know, because he's a superhero or whatever, he starts sass-mouthing these bad guys, and he gets double hard labor of all the other Atlanteans. So he's going to do twice as much work for having sass mouth, And all the other Atlanteans kind of know who, who he is because they, they call for him. They need the help. And he devises a plan. He needs to find out what the hell's going on. He kind of implants himself in this tube, and he overhears what's actually going on, and they've created this weapon apparently they stole the blueprint they're going to make one they're going to be able to to essentially melt down surface ships and eventually they'll put them on ships or planes and melt down everything they're here to take over the entire world it's very diabolical stuff but along the way a guppy a lone guppy makes its way through infiltrates the camp and aquaman is able to tell the fish outside that he needs their help and this one guppy is their only hope breed yeah and that's that's the problem with this. The best laid plans 
when you got a guy that can communicate to every sea creature down to the smallest guppy, it begs the question, what lunch was Aquaman preparing in the Aqua Cave? He was hungry. But what did they what could he have possibly eaten if he that he can he can't communicate with? Sometimes you gotta eat stuff you can talk to. Uh, possibly. But yeah. yeah, but yeah, thanks to that one guppy, the day could still be saved. It doesn't turn all that out all that well, Bree, because you know the, the uh the sea creatures show up, but these these terrible villains, these aliens from another dimension are kind of pushing them back with all their weaponry. They're pretty their guns are pretty powerful. Well, they, they had to be because this was a rare full-length story. <laughs> so they, they couldn't wrap it up in 12 pages. They had to stretch it out. So after that, uh, Joe, Aquaman is imprisoned even more. He's he was in he was already in double secret probation. Now he's actually in the holding cell, and he realizes that when they do a guard change, some seaweed is able to sneak out of the uh, of Atlantis. So he encodes the message to get to the guppy who's waiting for him. And in that, he ends up waiting a few hours. And finally, Aqualad joins him. I think he's on a – is he on a shark or a swordfish? He's on one or the other. Yeah. And they come up with this great play to take him out. And this is all really exciting stuff. I really like Aqualad because he's got the dirtiest nice boy mouth ever. He's using as many kind of almost bad words that you could use back in the 60s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. And, and, that, and after he breaks out – it's uh, you turn that page and chapter three starts literally with a bang. There are <laughs> it, it is just like an onslaught of action for page after page after Aquaman gets uh, broken out by Aqualad. Because they are too late. They've already made it to the surface. And it turns out there's like a phone or something in a lighthouse. Like, we can make it to the lighthouse. We can call in the troops. And they, they melt the goddamn lighthouse. Bree or Joe, what kind of diabolical shit is this? Right? Like, that's, um, you would think normally at this point in a comic, uh, especially, you know, early, you know, Silver Age, this is, this comic came out before Fantastic Four number one. So there's still no Marvel Age of Comics. So you would think like, oh, they saw the lighthouse. We're on page 22. They're going <laughs> to get to the lighthouse and and make the call. And they don't. That's, that's called subverting your expectations. As Joe mentioned, we're already at page 22 here, Breed. So we got to end this bad boy. So we end up getting Aquaman and Aqua Lad taking out the, the villains and, you know, removing their guns. And it kind of wraps up somewhat uh, somewhat fast after all the action. But, man, this thing is so much fun from beginning to end. And it was really fun seeing the interaction between Aquaman and Aqualad. Yeah, my favorite part of the story was after this diabolical plot, so well thought out, so intricate, all these moving parts, when, they fi- when Aquaman finally gets the upper hand, figures out why Trino hasn't used that weapon that he's carrying and he turns it on him. What does this guy do? No, don't use that on us. This will send us back to our dimension where we're (laughs) wanted criminals. (laughs) Don't say that out loud, you idiot. You're not supposed to say that part out loud. (laughs) But that's why these stories are so great. I mean, they were obviously written for kids it has a certain charm to them to read as adults and as comic book history. These are wonderful. And I said, again, Joe, great suggestion. This was a blast. No, I, I, I'm glad uh, we all dug it. I, I, I really have liked this story for a long time. And I'm, I'm and, yeah, cool. I've got and he and he wins the respect of the Atlanteans that they are, that they are now their ambassadors. Mm-hmm. We're men yep. fences. Now, yeah, yeah. I, I would think I probably would have clocked one or two of them for the treatment they gave my mom. But again, all's well. Yeah, a happy ending for all. I will say I hadn't actually uh, read a Ramona Fraden illustrated comic book. Very well done. Um, I'm surprised that, that you don't hear more about Ramona Fraden because this is, as far as Aquaman art goes, it is beautifully well done. The colorist, I don't know who the colorist was, but they deserve a special kudo because this thing is dynamite. It pops yeah. off the page. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if we will ever know. Um, I'm not sure colorists were credited at this point, but um, at DC at least. But yeah, it's uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it, you know, and you can go back and read uh, a lot of her other 
uh, Aquaman comics. Uh, she also had a run on uh, Plastic Man. Uh, she did, I think, one issue of Fantastic Four. Uh, she did the Super Friends comic for a long time. So, uh, you know, definitely uh, go out and uh, dig up some of her work. She's still around. I think she's 95. But, um, but yeah, so uh, appreciate her now while you can. Joe, where can people find this? I don't think this is something that's going to be reprinted as much as some of the other things that we have. You're probably going to have to go out in the, the, the trades and collections unless you want to go get, like, the original. Yeah, I mean, I have the uh, archive edition, and this one I think you could still get for a reasonable uh, price. I, I bought this, like, when it came out on the shelf, but, I mean, there's also, I believe, the, the, sh the black and white showcases, and, and those, uh, yeah, that um would be an easy way to grab it as well those for the most part i haven't seen those go for astronomical prices so you know those are two ways it's collected uh it should be available uh, digitally if you have you know the dc app and, or, or comiXology things like that so uh, you should be able to get a hold of it i personally am with jack miller and ramona Fraden. Aquaman should not be an edgy character. Aquaman should be a nice, wholesome character because I think it works much better here than all the attempts that they've done in the past uh, couple decades to really put a weird edge on the character. He's he's, uh, he's quite wholesome and it works really effective. If you can't get enough comic book retrospective, not too long ago we talked about an entire story arc, The Flash of Two Worlds. This is one of the greatest comic books ever written, certainly one of the best Flash comics. It introduces pretty much the multiverse to DC Comics. It's a huge thing. If you can't get enough of that, we've got the entire playlist. Over 50 comic book retrospectives. Definitely check this out if you want some more.